John, let's sort of cut to the chase right at the top. You backed the other brother for the leadership. You've heard Ed Miliband's speech this afternoon. Are you now thinking you made the right choice or you were still right? You know, you, you were wrong and you should have backed Ed. Uh, no, I, I backed David because I thought um, 30 years ago I made the mistake of voting for leaders of the Labour Party on the basis of them being closest to the views I hold, which is, I think is quite a dangerous thing to do because I don't think with the views I hold you'd win an election like that. So it seems to me self-evident that you vote for the person you think is best equipped to get over the line to be Prime Minister as leader of your party, um, irrespective of whether you have differences with them or not. Um, so therefore I chose David, the party chose otherwise. I thought Aidan Miniman made a great speech this afternoon. I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, and began to define himself, which is precisely what he needed to do. So um, what interests me is the actual sense of unity across the party as well that is emerging just in the last couple of days. So I'm very optimistic about the outcome and the leader we have now, irrespective of the fact it wasn't my choice to lead the party. Yeah, yeah sure, <coughs> sure. I mean, you, you obviously must have had some doubts about Ed, otherwise you wouldn't have backed. David, did it reassure some of the doubts that you might yeah, have? Yeah, it did, actually. I like the way he's talking about family. I like the way he's talking about community. He was talking about hope, optimism. You know, it, it, it wasn't just a checklist of policies, because that's what I don't think we need. I think we need a deeper sense of a sentiment around Labour again. Um, and I think he began that process, because we got time, and he wasn't just ticking boxes, he was talking a, in a deeper way about society and himself. Because the trouble with me, for the four guys who ran, is their whole political character had been defined them by themselves as office holders within the party and the government rather than having an independently formed political DNA before they entered office. Yeah. So they now have, to, they are on a journey of self-discovery almost politically. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I thought that journey started pretty well today. Um, and I, I, I actually, I listen to it in a way that I don't usually, because they usually leave me cold, these conference speeches, right? But I listened to it and it was quite a thoughtful, um, quite a yeah, rich, so. textured speech. You know, it's really it had an argument, didn't it? It did have an argument and it wasn't just a series of, policy sound bites crafted by the focus group, which you could intend to see. And I thought this was a deeper sense of identity about who he is as a person, which is precisely what I think he needs to do. Uh, uh, of course, one of the little paradoxes of the speech was that he stressed the importance of family a lot in it, which you do, uh, the man who ran and defeated his brother. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. I mean, to me, that's... Wait, it wouldn't happen in my family. What? You wouldn't stand against your brother. That's so that you, what, you'd you all wouldn't. defer to the oldest? Would you? Yeah, you would, yeah. Are you the you oldest? Would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's just, that's so just coincidental. But, no, but there is quite a, a... Well, I'm not going down there. Do you think David should, should run for the shadow cabinet? I mean, look, I, I, was, I tell you what really... The, the thing that's really impressed me this week is the dignity by which David Miliband yeah, okay. handled this, okay. which is just yeah. extraordinary. I mean, like, the strength of... Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I think, I mean, I've known him for 20 years, right, and I didn't realise what a substantial figure he is, actually, and just until the last few days. It made me proud that I support him, actually. I was very pleased for yeah. him and, and the way he handled it. One thing I want to test, because you do have this... You have a general image, I think it's fair to say, a street fighter. You could have visualised you throwing people out at nightclubs in Dagenham. But is that really the true John Crowders? First of all, I know you spent this morning buying a dog. What breed of dog was it? <laughs> we didn't buy a dog. We were looking at... Oh, dogs. you were looking at dogs. Looking you were at... viewing dogs. Yeah, we... yeah. We're going to get a Border Terrier. Border see. Terrier, OK. Like a sort of country dog. OK, you like fishing a lot, don't you? I do like fishing. Yeah, I've always liked yeah. fishing. I, um, How often do you go fishing? Yeah, actually, I did go Friday. Uh, Friday? Yeah. I Friday before a Labour conference, you spent fishing. You know what? I, you know, okay. I was sitting there fishing, okay. and I was thinking, given that the guys who were in the... And, and Diana must have been in the race, they must have been on the ceiling in terms of pressure, having gone through four months of the election. <laughs> okay. The, the I thought it was quite a... I was quite glad I decided not to contest the leadership okay. Okay. Let's just stick to the point for the moment. So you like fishing a lot and you like country dogs. Uh, you play golf, yeah? You're still a member of the Walton Heath Golf Club in Surrey. Quite a long way from Dakenham that, isn't it? There's a long history of parliamentarians playing golf in the Walton Heath. It's fantastic. I played once this year there, I'm afraid, even though did okay. we, you know, it's, uh, it's a fantastic golf club. Yeah. Yeah. What's the annual membership fee? 800 quid. 800 pounds a year. 
That's quite a lot of the minimum wage, isn't it? I think it's the yeah. same as a West Ham season ticket. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm talking, are you building a house in Ireland? Have I been um, correctly informed about that? I'll tell you what. <laughs> Wait, it's all right, it's almost over. <laughs> I tell you, this, this was hatched. Actually, this is quite an interesting question. This was hatched a few years ago we, in yeah. Australia. We were around this big dinner table with all my cousins, and we were talking about, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a place in Ireland that all the family all come back and they all go there? Could, there was a sort of haven. And it became a sort of discussion about belonging, and we found this land on, on the beach there, and we're in the process of trying to buy it, because for the next couple of years, I want to build a house there. Um, I want to literally build, and it costs about the same as a one-bedroom flat in Arlston. You know, so really, we're we're we're, um, we're build, That's that, that's the <coughs> project for the next couple of years. Oh, is right. to literally build a house. But you can see why anybody looking at the CV we've just outlined. Yeah, yeah. Border no, terrier I, buyer. Hold on. Oh, fisherman, uh, golf club, eight hundred pounds a year. <laughs> country house in Ireland. Married to a peeress. <laughs> You're a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I mean, if, if you, if you, if you, um, if you, empirically, there is some evidence. <laughs> you spent a lot of time uh, fighting the, the BMP, who got pretty soundly trashed. I think most people are very glad to see them soundly trashed the last general election. Does that mean they've been put back in their box, or are they still people we should be worrying about? To me, the BMP are not the issue. It is the sentiment that lies behind it, and that sense of loss and cultural identity and the sense of um, people feeling that they are, they are the full guys for globalisation. And, and how do you do that? How do you, and actually, Ed, to his great credit, is starting to talk about those who lose. Because if you go back to Blair's 2005 speech, it's fascinating to because he talks about globalisation as um, a benign force where people have to step up. There's no downside. Yeah. And now yeah. we're having a more balanced thing. Because in Dagenham, what you've seen is, because it's the cheapest housing in London, yeah. and you've had massive deindustrialization with the Ford car plant. You have extraordinary rates of demographic change. So you almost have the sense of globalization ripping through a microclimate, you know? And it's turbulent and all sorts of things spin off. The BNP are symptomatic of it. But what worries me is more is the English Defence League. Because they are tied into, through certain individuals, key um, key uh, elements of what could be a prospective Tea Party policy. Really? You know, you know, really? and, you know certain yeah. forms of evangelical churches, um, some high big funders, and it's worrying. It's really worrying to me. And it's lived out on the streets now. It is day to day out there on the streets, and it's anchored in sport and working class culture, and I think it's very, very worrying. John Grudders. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John.